Well, hi, everybody. This is Leslie Page. I hope everybody can hear me all well. Um, all right. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is part of our Stay Connected webinar series. It's actually webinar number 13, believe it or not. My name is Leslie Page, coming to you from a remote Lewis University and our Department of Organizational Leadership. And I'll do a quick check to make sure everybody can hear okay. If you can just throw something in the chat, let me know that the volume sounds okay to everybody. Perfect, thanks, Rock. Good to know. I am so excited to get started talking with you about a topic that just a few weeks ago seemed pretty um, unlikely that we'd be discussing in length today. So today our topic will be talking about how leaders can bring people back and transition to the workplace. So a couple weeks ago, that seemed again like a kind of unlikely scenario, but we've seen a lot of change just in the matter of a few weeks. And of course, we have counties and states that are returning to this work, returning to work, which makes this conversation even more necessary. So spoiler alert, I am going to tell you that yes, I've done some research, I've definitely done some reading, but I don't have all the answers. So I am hoping that while this is a webinar and I do plan to share with you the information I found and present some ideas, that we can also have an active chat or discussion because I sincerely feel as though the answer to the question about how we bring employees back to work after the COVID pandemic is gonna be a conversation that many people need to be part of. So I'll present some ideas today, as I mentioned, but I am hoping that you will actively join in the conversation through chat or even coming off mute. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is officially welcome you to the webinar, of course, and ask you a question. So over the last several weeks, you have been asked the question probably many times, what's new? How are you? One way we might think about that question is, uh, what could be new? We've been holed up at home for eight weeks now or longer. Nothing at all is new. But in fact, the contrary is really true. So much is new and we have learned a great deal because our work world and in many instances, our home worlds have shifted and we've learned new skills Maybe we're not calling them skills, but we have learned new things over the last few weeks. So to loosen us up, get our creative juices flowing, I'd love to ask you the question and invite you to come off mute or enter into, ooh, um, sorry about that, um, enter into the chat your new experience. What is something you might have learned or experienced over the last week? So please share. While you're doing that, I'll go first and I will reveal that in the last week, and of course these can be serious or you can be playful, I have learned to cut my own hair that did not go as well as planned, but you can't really tell. Um, anyway, I'm curious and I know Marie Pollock is here a dedicated and wonderful colleague who has offered to help manage the chat for me as we go. So what are you seeing in the chat, Marie? So it looks like it's, things are coming in. So I have, I found, I have, a, I've naturally begun retooling my skills for what's the next kind of phase in their life, personally and professionally. Um, fighting the internet connection and online mission, me, meeting issues. <laughs> learning <laughs> that that's part of the process and not to worry. Um, becoming more patient. Yeah, I will agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Working with students while they're still sleeping in their beds in their PJs. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, headspace matters. It makes a big difference. That's a really great one. Uh, learning how to set up my camera and mic and slowly becoming brave enough to use it. So glad. <laughs> Um, and then we have learning Zoom and video conferences, loving my family, but sometimes don't like them. Yeah, I, that's, that's true. It's a good statement. Really. <laughs> uh, mine is, I really like going outside, I discovered, and I learned to cut my husband's hair, although I, I don't know how he feels about it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think next time I'll solicit a little help before I try to take the scissors to my own hair. It just is very challenging to cut one's own hair. Yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> and then it says, despite our Illinois governor's stay-at-home order, because our business is considered essential, we may return to work before the order is lifted. And it's troubling for me, says Christopher. 
Yeah. Uh, managing home and work and children's e-learning and seeking out conversations and connecting with coworkers via Zoom and FaceTime. Let me go back. I feel like I missed something. Oh, having a real appreciation for teachers. However, I have a whole new a new level of appreciation for them. Uh, and today's actually Teacher Appreciation Day, so that's, that's a great one, Joe. Oh, jo. that is a great comment. Okay, I can tell this is going to be a good group because you're already very actively engaged in our chat, which is wonderful. I do invite you, if you'd like to come off mute throughout the presentation, there are some questions that I'll pose, so you can absolutely feel free to do that as well. But the chat is fine. I love hearing your ideas. So thank you. Now that we're all warmed up, I think we're probably ready to proceed with the topic of today, which is how we are going to go about this transition back to work. So let's take a look at where we're at today. The world has shifted considerably over the last two months. So the, according to Gallup polls, the percent of full-time employees that say that the COVID pandemic has disrupted their life a great deal or a fair amount has jumped from 58 to 81 percent. Maybe not surprising, but a pretty staggering statistic. So we are in a stress and disrupted place, yet we are learning and we are progressing to your points in the chat. We are continuing to adapt and evolve, and that will be part of our discussion today. There's a lot of emphasis on learning, but there is disruption in our world today, and that sets an important context for how we understand returning to work because we need to know where we're at now to kind of get inside how employees and employers might feel about the return to work. I agree with what you've said in the chat and it, it won't be an easy task. However, we do have some information to go with and that is what we hope to talk about today. Gallup polls also tells us a few other points that are relevant for us to just keep in our mind. 40% of employees say that their employer has frozen hiring practices, 33%, have reduced hours or shifts. So work is being impacted greatly. The percent of full-time employees working from home has increased, almost doubled from 33 to 61%. And the percent of parents, to many of your points in the chat, working full-time who've kept their kids home from school because of the crisis has increased from under 50%, closer to 40 even, to virtually everybody. So our workplaces have become crowded or maybe empty, right? Our work is complicated. We're trying to do things in a very different manner and we're just getting a rhythm. So what will it be like when we think about trying to return? And I'm not gonna say very many times, if just maybe this once, there won't be a normal, but there will be a new way that we return to work. And so as we think about that process, it's important, I think, and humbling to just remember the stress and the disruption that people have experienced for so much time, because there will be tension, nerves, and anxiety that we're going to want to reduce. So I have two questions to ask. And again, you are welcome to come off mute, or Marie, if you'll help to respond to some points in the chat. First question of the two is, when we think about returning to work, what are employees looking for? as they return to work. What are employees looking for? So we're getting some responses in the chat. A unanimous on safety, um, yeah. slow and steady, says Diane. Uh, everyone to feel safe. So I think it's physical and psychological safety is a, a, a consensus, I think. Uh, someone said normal again, six feet apart <laughs> between workspaces, yeah. transparency of information. Um, mm -hmm. Diane has the same job question mark. <laughs> Fair uh, question, <laughs> yep. Uh, flexibility, continued flexibility, uh, safety and communication, says Jason. Understanding, even more communication, says yeah. Joe. So huge like you guys wrote this presentation for me. This is great. <laughs> April says empathy. Ah, thank you. Absolutely. Empathy, right? Times have been hard and it's important not to underestimate that. So that's one piece of the puzzle. So my next question to you, what can employers provide to employees during this time of transition? 
what's on the employer's side of this balance sheet? So um, Mike made an interesting point, I think, to the first question, but it, it oh. also relates to the second question, which is a lack of subjectivity in, uh, you know, in assuming what safety means to people. Yeah. And then clear, not vague guidance, uh -huh. uh, a plan for how we'll get back, the need to have a plan so everyone is on that plan train. Yep. <laughs> Transparency, a vision for the new normal. Excellent. Excellent. Again, I really think you were yesterday sitting right next to me. Uh, I mean, weeks ago when I was preparing this presentation, not yesterday. Um, those are great points. And I think what we start to see is that there's a balance between what employees desire and what employers will deliver. But it's a complex, interconnected web. And that's what makes this conversation interesting, but also makes it a very unique question to address, that is the transition back to work for individual organizations, which is why I couldn't possibly provide all the answers, but I hope at least that we talk today about some things that add insight to this, what will be certainly a complicated process. So here goes. Employees desire, much as you said, trust, compassion. I'd almost call that, Mike mentioned, a lack of subjectivity, right? Um, we want to, or we want to make sure we're compassionate, that we're understanding the complexity that people have faced. Some sense of stability, I'd throw in there, the issues around safety, security, psychological and physical, lots of questions will happen there, and hope. Employers have an opportunity to deliver, how do you like that, a clear plan, okay, as if you had read my mind. Preparation, to be prepared on the job, that's gonna surface in our dialogue today. Open communication, we're going to see, hopefully, lots more of that, and care and compassion for the well-being of the individual. So I was just having a little fun here with these arrows. I think you could probably connect every bullet point with every other one in the two lists. So forgive that I stopped eventually because I thought it would just be a hot mess to have arrows all over the whole screen. But you get the point that this is a complicated and interconnected process but we need to balance our consideration of what employees may need and what the employer can deliver. And this helps us to transition our conversation into what it is a future workplace might look like. Thank you for all your great input in the chat, which again, just fit exactly with the reading and the research that I found on this topic. This is a personal belief of my own, but it's wrapped up in all the points that we just mentioned. I firmly believe that it boils down to employees coming to work for two reasons. One, to feel valued, and second, to add value. So feel valued, add value. And when we think about leadership, which will be the turning point in conversation that we have today, we wanna to remember these are the facets that are driving employees as they come to work, feel value and add value. So let's take a look at what the Harvard Business Review offered in a recent article about how we might eventually begin this slow return to work. They offer four points that I think are highly relevant, um, maybe a little hard to digest, but probably our new reality. One, Engagement. So employee engagement is not a new topic. Those of us who work in the field of organizational development, human resources, employee engagement has been something that we think about. But employee engagement is going to be a priority. It will no longer be a nice to have. It'll be a must. And that's really relevant so that you might think about the jobs within your organization that reflect talent managers, human resources, trainers, consultants, coaches, change agents, they will be tapped on to keep a pulse as to the engagement level within the organization because more than ever, employers will know that people are the asset of their organization and we will need to come together to get the job done. So engagement, again, will become a must 
not a nicety. So when we currently read, and those of you who are students in the program or alum from our program have taken coursework where we study, you know, the best places to work, usually those are places that thrive in the area of engagement, and I would expect that to continue. But I'm going to think that this is something that transcends that best of list. And according to Harvard Business Review, engagement, again, will be a must have. Interestingly, they talk about repurposing. <clears throat> when we think about the work we do, we might go back to a work world that's a little bit different. So historically, we have worked in silos. You hear phrases like stay in your own lane, right? We work divisionally, departmentally, functionally within our area. But working from home and working remotely in many instances has caused us to work together in a different way. And we'll see that repurposing with a strategic alignment across functions, across departments to service our customers, to meet our market need, that will emerge as a new trend. Closely related to that is learning. And you mentioned that in some of your comments in the chat. I'm thrilled to hear that that's on your mind too. So those of you who are lifelong learners, and I know you're out there, and organizations who thrive on lifelong learning, that means they focus on development, training, learning new skills. And by the way, if you remember from our opening question today, you have learned new things over the last eight weeks. Many of those are skills that will translate when we eventually do end up back at work. But at work, we will be learning in a new way. We'll continually be advancing our knowledge so that we can repurpose and function a little bit more collaboratively than we saw before. Last point, unfortunately, letting people go. I think that, at least according to what I'm reading, it might be a common trend. We are seeing it already. The statistics are there. So we want to be mindful within our organization of a few things. One, these are really challenging times financially, economically. Our organizations are going to need to make very difficult decisions. As leaders, we're going to want to pay attention not only to those who leave, but those who remain. And when we think about those people who stay with the organization and the roles that they're in, which might not be exactly the same role that we started with if we have a reduction in force and fewer people, that's where things like repurposing and learning become so critical. So what I'm really describing is a more agile, more adaptable workplace than what we saw before. Beautiful thought. Some additional changes we might expect to see. And some of these, I believe, are already happening, like the first one. We might expect to see that our workplace will become more digital with remote work. I'm mean, gonna just, if you can see my hand, do a little check, done that, right? Well, that's what we've been doing for the last eight weeks. But it's probably natural to expect when we transition back to work. There will be some people who say, you know, I can do this job from home. Some employers who say, we can have you, keep you on our payroll, and you can do that job from home. So there is going to be a continuation of this flexibility of work and life, and we're going to jump ahead to that in a minute. Before I get to that, though, a focus on outputs rather than FaceTime. So I'd like to explain this with a personal example, and sadly, it dates me a little bit, but in the 1990s, I had the great fortune of working for Sears Roebuck and Company at their corporate headquarters. It was the softer side of Sears campaign, if any of you were around at that time. It was a wonderful place to work for the company, contrary to where we are at today. But this was a time when our culture had a very strong sense of when you come to work, and when you leave work. So what I'm really talking about is a value placed on those who arrive early and continue to stay late. And so what people did was learn tricks, and you might have heard these or have your own, where you leave the light on in your office or a coat over your chair so that it looks like you're there. You're getting the, <laughs> the credit for the hours worked, but the focus isn't on what you're actually delivering. So predictions are when we return to work, we're gonna see a little bit of a shift if your organization hasn't already in that mindset where we focus on what people are producing. Because think about how chaotic the last eight weeks have been, but you're still doing your work. So we know that people can do work and that's what's important, not what time they clocked in and not what time they clocked out. 
Going back to that digital workplace and remote work, finding balance, point number three, respect for work-life blend. I kind of like the word blend people throw in. We hear balance a lot, but I know for me personally speaking, it is feeling like a blend. There are lots of people in the house and it's feeling crowded and I'm finding it hard to sometimes separate when I need to get my work done and when I need to get house things done. So a respect for that work-life blend. Many of you mentioned in the chat this point, and that's so I'm so glad, stronger communications. So we have seen within our organizations, I know my e email box is full of them and I'm sure yours is too. Notifications from the university, Lewis University where I work. Notifications from just about every organization, affiliation, association that I belong to, which are wonderful. They're providing resources, support, and help in a way that has never happened before. Sometimes those resources are offered for free. We're just trying to help each other out. So there's a prediction that as we return to work, there will be stronger communication trends. That probably helps with some of the things we talked about on previous slides around building a plan, sharing a plan, training and learning. So this all fits together, hopefully, in a very nice cohesive way where that communication is effective which brings us to our last point that also helps to increase trust, empathy, and transparency, which you all mentioned in the chat as well. These are fundamental aspects of what employees look for as we return to work. One so other thing, uh, sorry to interrupt. One please. thing Diane said that kind of fits into this is that HR needs to have a seat at the table now. So one of the changes we might see is you know, more leadership in that, in that department. Great point. And thanks to you, Marie and Diane for bringing that up. Absolutely. I think that there will be back to previous points, a very high emphasis on the human capital element of our workplace, like never before. So for some organizations, that's already been a highlight, a strength, but for many organizations, they're going to need to step it up. And I do think that human resources professionals will have a very strong role in that. I'm seeing that at our university already as well. So great point. Thank you both for sharing. Anything else in the chat to throw in? That's it for now. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. All right. Very good. Very good. So changes we might expect to see at work. Here's where I'd love your input. Again, I have one perspective. I have some data that I'm sitting with here, but what is on your list? What would you add? What do you expect to see with our transition back to work? Okay, we've got stuff coming in. Arrows on the floors in the hallway. <laughs> yeah, if it's anything like the grocery store, those are super not helpful, right? Because you can't tell which way the arrow's keeping you trying to go one direction. But okay, good. That is good. We might see that. We really might in an effort to keep distant. Good point. Wait, I muted myself by mistake. Changes in the cafeteria, which I don't know what that means. Oh. So if you want to come off mute for that one. A new lens on, um, on leadership, more EQ is required. Less yes. uh, conference rooms, They're, it's coming in a little fast. So <laughs> less conference room meetings, more video conferencing, new bathroom policies, <laughs> continuing the virtual meetings, empathy in the sense that people and coworkers have change during this time and we might need to rethink their personalities their strengths um we can't all eat at one table without a mask <laughs> more flexibility and i think more project-based work you know going back to your point of um not the focus on the face time or the time okay you know are you working eight hours but maybe more of a focus on the results of projects and how we complete projects together yeah that's great points and then more patient and group projects more patience and definitely eq yeah it sounds like we might have a few people joining us that have been to a couple of the other webinar series. Dr. Mike Cherry puts on a great webinar 
related to emotional intelligence. So I'm thinking that's sinking in. Otherwise, you are also just very astute um, <laughs> audience members here today as well. But absolutely, emotional intelligence is a really great point that will help to transition this conversation because emotional intelligence is also about balance. And so if there's one thing you'll walk away with uh, from this webinar with, we're really talking about balance, right? Whether it's employee and employers, we're really balancing Emotional intelligence is a balance of our understanding of self and the understanding of others. So when we talk about trying to put subjectivity to the side, when we talk about trying to maximize empathy, these are great ways for us to demonstrate as a leader, as a coworker, just as a human being, emotional intelligence, which can help us because everybody, even when we return to work, might be in a very different place, psychologically speaking, in their comfort level in doing so. And I think that was raised in the chat as well. So thank you. Yeah, Thanks there's for... two oh. more. One's a question, which I'm not sure of, but uh, so Christopher says lots and lots of hand sanitizer. And the question <laughs> is, what if our leaders lost their mojo? I'm not quite sure what that means. If Diane, if you want to come off mute or add more to the chat <laughs> so I can give that question to, to Leslie. I'm not sure what the question means, so. I'm kind of happy to jump in. Diane, if you are willing to come off mute, please just interrupt me. But I'm going to guess a response like that might mean we're all human. So even when our leaders come back to work, right, they're going to be managing their own self-regulation in terms of how they're responding. And at a human level, everybody is responding very differently to this pandemic. And so a leader might come back. They might come back thriving and strong and pumped to get the job done, whatever that job is. They've been apart for a long while. We're gonna be excited to see each other. But it could be that people come back to work and this includes leaders with some reservations too. Our companies might look and feel a little bit different. We might have lost some of our staff. Um, financial implications are great for most of our organizations because many cannot really thrive in a way that we had just eight weeks ago. So I think I understand that. I think it's a great point, Diane. Um, that'll be a nice transition as we start talking about leadership too. So thank you for that. She said, yes, what Leslie says, LOL. <laughs> it's like, I read your mind. <laughs> you were thank in you, her Diane. head. <laughs> thank you. And um, April says, an understanding of employees as a whole, not just your employee, but as a mom or sister, a spouse, a daughter. Absolutely. I love that. And that makes me think of the, the slide where a work-life blend Right? Mm -hmm. we, we are a whole human and that will surface because stressful and disruptive, disruptive and emotional times, they make that bubble out in us, right? I mean, we're sometimes loving, we're sometimes angry, whatever it is, but those emotions, they're pretty hard to cap. So I think that that's a wonderful point. Thank mm -hmm. you all so much. Rock for a super fun. great point. Top leaders recalibrating engagement, morale versus results. Right? Perfect segue, Rock. It's like you read my mind. So that's going to be a great segue for the next little part of what we talk about now. So we have covered and I've shared with you some data and some facts. All right. So those are important for us to understand the context of where we're at now, what our work is like at home, what factors we might need to consider as we think about that slow transition back to work. So let's take that and kind of move it to the side. Now comes the really hard question, and you've already started to peel that back a little bit. How are we going to do that? <laughs> we got the data, shows us, you know, times are hard, people are stressed, work is going to be challenging, okay, but how do we do this? So, as you might guess, teaching organizational leadership, I've, of course, have a bias toward the understanding and the study of leadership, but leadership is one piece of this puzzle. So, how do we return to work? We want to think about the leadership of that process. And I do want to remind everybody, leadership is not a title. Leadership is how we act. In an organization, you may have a leadership role, and I am not trying in any way to diminish that importance. But everybody can act as a leader in the teams or the work group where they function. We have an opportunity to be our best self or try to help others. And so let's think about leadership 
broadly so that it's inclusive to anybody who's tuning into this webinar. But leadership is at the forefront of our answer as to how we transition back to work. So, as I mentioned, as a professor who studies organizational leadership, it's only natural we might take a quick look, and I promise it'll be about 30 seconds, not longer than that. What we know about modern leadership trends. This is gonna help direct us to better understand how we might approach leadership returning to work post COVID. So it once was that leadership was very bureaucratic and autocratic in nature, leader equals boss. But times have changed. And those of you again, who are students or alumni from our program, or who just know this on your own, will know that more recently, our workplaces are different even pre-COVID. And the way we study and approach leadership is different as well. So we use, in our new modern day leadership world, pull tactics rather than push tactics. So what does that mean? Well, a pull tactic means I, as a leader, I'm inviting you in. I want to collaborate with you. I'd like to learn from you, share knowledge with you. This is a good thing. Pulling you in, embracing you, engaging you, and including you. Okay? That directly relates to being encouraging. We also see leadership patterns today that are encouraging through reinforcement and positivity. Positive leadership has a whole following of its own. Positive leadership is very, very well versed in the area of encouragement. We want people to feel engaged at work. Remember that slide, engagement is gonna be a necessity, not a nice to have. Innovation and creativity are also at the key of leadership today. How many times are we told to think out of the box? Well, now imagine in a post-COVID world, we're working in these kind of reconfigured work groups, right? Where we might be repurposing our skills, learning new skills. This takes innovation and creativity to have not only the mind set, an open mind, but also the skill set and the agility to do that, which directly leads to diversity. And by diversity, I really mean diversity of thought and perspective. So our work groups and teams, and there's a bounty of research to support, that teams and work groups will be more effective and productive when we have diversity of thought. If we all think the same way, we will not get as far as if we all think differently. So now imagine we come back to work post-COVID. We have a wonderful resource with diversity of thoughts and opinions because people have done some soul searching in this time on their own. And we're going to have, I think, a wealth of opportunity to draw on that. Last point about modern day leadership, everybody's watching. Sounds a little creepy, and I don't mean it necessarily in a stalker or social media way, although that is a reality too. What I mean by that, leaders are role models, and I mean that in the best possible way. Leaders need to walk the talk. So what leaders say and what leaders do are very important for our understanding in the sense that people will emulate what they see and hear. And that is how the culture of our organization is created. And there's a great opportunity for leaders to play a pivotal role as we bring people back to work in being that positive role model. So we'll hope that they haven't lost their mojo. That will be the hope. Questions or thoughts that have surfaced before I carry on? Uh, just an agreement uh, for that last point that yes, leaders are always on stage. Right? Always on stage. And that is important. And um, quite frankly, that will be a challenge because to the other point raised, leaders are human just like anybody else. And so we're not always gonna be at our best, especially when we're a little bit nervous. We're off kilter, right? But life is so disruptive right now. I, I admire anybody who feels like they've got both feet on the ground and that they even know what day of the week it is. Oh my gosh, I think it's Wednesday, but I'm not even sure. I'm pretty sure today's Wednesday. It is hard to feel grounded right now. and so. Leaders need to recognize that within themselves, and here's where emotional intelligence comes into play as well. But they are being watched, and so it will be important to set the tone, be the role model. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. But you do have an opportunity to set the positive tone that you want to see within your organization. So I'm viewing it from a very positive lens. So that transitions us to a conversation around leadership behaviors. And Rock, without knowing it, you gave the perfect segue into this conversation. And those of you who have heard me present before might hear me talk about leadership behaviors 
as being either task or relationship types of behavior. So let me spend just a minute queuing up this slide and then I'm gonna be asking you for some input. So historically, those who have studied leadership, and this is for decades, have found that leadership behaviors can be divided into two very broad, big buckets. One being task types of behaviors. It's true, we need leaders to get the job done, to focus on goals, to achieve results. So those task behaviors have probably even most traditionally, when we think historically, been associated with leadership. But leadership behaviors can also be defined by relationship types of behaviors. This is that bond that we build between leaders and followers that's really based on a connection, an emotional connection where we are engaging people. So I just want to highlight some examples that have already surfaced in our webinar conversation today. When we think about task behaviors, we've already talked about the importance of coming back to work organizations or employers having a plan and being prepared, helping employees, that is, be prepared for their job. So I'd like to ask the audience today, what else do you see as being task behaviors that will be important for leaders to have some control of, right, mindset, be mindful of, as we return back to work? Hey, Leslie, this is Adrian Guerrero. Hey, Adrian. I can um, share some thoughts on that. I think one thing that's really important that maybe is on that more on that task side is coming back and setting goals and making sure that there's clarity on the vision and the values and the goals for the individual as you're coming back into work, right? Mm -hmm. Because that may have changed. We may have let go of some goals for the time being while we're in this. And so, so what is our focus? coming back when maybe, maybe, eventually we'll be able to have a little bit more focus on things that are work related. Great point. And actually, even just hearing you say that, my mind is going thinking, that's exactly how interconnected this web is because setting goals based on our new work patterns require us to be mindful, topics like repurposing and learning that we talked about, but communicative as well. So how then are we sharing maybe a new vision for what is deemed the important set of things we do? Because we might not do all the things we did before. We might now prioritize on what are the foundational tasks for our organization to succeed, especially in the short term, because many people will be ramping up to even kind of stay afloat. And so we will have to refocus and set some goals, but that will need to be communicated clearly. Thank you for coming off mute and sharing that. Thank you. Well, a lot's happening in the chat. A lot of agreement with the conversation. <laughs> um, Rock made a great point in agreeing with uh, the point he said, you know, if you wanna make sure that those goals are reasonably given in the current situation. Yeah. And so we've also had some clearly defined vision, uh, redefining job descriptions, uh, communicating the vision and laying out the goals, whether new or updated. And now we might, might be the time to do those tasks once everyone returns. Uh, once everyone returns is when the empathy will be needed. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm hearing on the task side, I mean, we've got the plans, the goals, the objectives. We need to understand what it is we're doing. It's hard to stop that conversation from moving right over to that relationship side, which is what I just heard you talk about and what Rock set up so well, that it's a balance of getting things done, but with an appreciation for people. And this isn't rocket science. That's what's great news. This is not hard to understand. It's not really even necessarily hard to practice. Unless, of course, we find ourselves in a situation where we're very stressed and under tight time demands, then sometimes we don't practice our best self. But these are manageable tactics that leaders can use. So let's switch the conversation over to that relationship side. I'd love to get your input. So examples of relationship behaviors that you'd like to see in leadership as we return to work. Here are two listed that came up already in today's conversation, compassion and empathy. What else would you add? Leslie, this is Adelina. Hi, Adelina. 
<laughs> uh, in regards to relationship behaviors, I'd like to add that um, <clears throat> I work at Christian Brothers Services and our CEO sends a weekly update to all employees. And one thing I wanted to share was um, what he put at the end of his update was to um, continue to be kind during this difficult time as many people are coping in different ways. And also he quoted St. John Baptist LaSalle when, in one of his letters saying, be warm hearted to everyone speaking to others in a gentle and respectful way. Wonderful. Those are words to live by. And it's so nice to see when we talk about role modeling, a great way for leaders to demonstrate what they're hoping the culture will foster and that is the appreciation for individuals and the hardship that everybody goes through. You know, early on in this pandemic, people would say, how, how are you doing? Are you, you know, okay? And some people are like, yeah, I'm fine. It's really okay. Nobody has been unimpacted by this. So whether it's big or small, I've come to learn that everybody, whether it's something they're thoroughly processing psychologically or not, everybody is impacted. And that's a wonderful statement from your CEO. Um, to remember to be mindful of others and where they're at. A great connection to emotional intelligence too. So thanks, Adelina. So some other great things coming from the chat are talking about patience, encouragement, and then kindness is a big theme. A new enlightenment for leaders of the benefit of remote work for those who thought you could only produce under a watchful eye. <laughs> it's well said. Um, the Diane says, you can still smile with a mask on. That's a great point. And that really um, further emphasizes the conversation that we've been having, right? Where you talk about the importance of getting the job done versus how long you're sitting and doing it, right? We need to focus on what's really important people getting the work done. And as leaders, we're going to need to step up to find not only how do we set goals that are meaningful on that task side of the balance sheet, but how do we respond to people personally, individually, as humans on that relationship side? And that'll be different. That's what makes it challenging for each individual that you encounter may need something a little bit different from you. There are some universal needs that we've been hearing a lot about. Safety, empathy, compassion. So we know that going into it, just being emotionally intelligent, understanding our own reactions and how we respond to others can go a tremendously far way to helping a leader bring their workforce back productively. Some of the specific nuances we're gonna need to figure out within our own organizations and the cultures where you work, because with the number of people on this webinar, I can assure you those cultures are very different and they may all be very positive but they're also different. And so a leader needs to understand that. Kind of brings us back when we talk about leadership, often the answer is, when we think about effective leadership, it depends, right? It depends because it's gonna depend on the situation. So kind of tying back to this notion here though of task and relationship behaviors, what's key to remember and a key learning point of this session today is balance. And so research also shows us that the most effective leaders are those who can balance task and relationship types of behaviors. And I think post COVID, we will see that more than ever because what we need, we discuss what employees are looking for, what employers can provide, they're really a balance of task and relationship and the research supports that we can't go wrong thinking about and demonstrating and behaving in ways that reflect both task and relationship elements of a complex leadership dynamic. So with that, I'm gonna kind of pivot to say, so what are some leadership styles that focus on task and relationship types of behaviors. Here's just a few, and I know the audience is varied today. So some of you are already familiar with what these leadership styles may be. Others may be seeing this for the first time. Transformational leadership really focuses on change. So there's a huge advantage for transformational leaders as we return back to work. Transformational leaders build bonds with their employees by focusing on individual contributions and individual consideration, recognizing that everybody has a talent to bring, and we want to bring out that talent within our work groups, collectively involving everybody. 
goes back to encouraging and those pull tactics that we talked about. Servant leaders focus on what people need, building strength through training. Think about learning and repurposing. Exposure and confidence, which comes with time. Super leadership is really about leading others to lead themselves. And if there has ever been a opportunity to demonstrate that. We have people working in their own home environments right now. They're doing it on their own. That's probably without the micromanaging that we might be used to if we had our boss breathing down our neck. We don't. We are working in our own workspaces and we are getting the job done. So super leadership really is about letting people develop the leadership skills within themselves. Again, I don't mean by a title, I mean by your presence and your contributions and step aside to let people grow. Those are just a few. So I would throw out to you as a question, what type of leadership do you think we need to make it through the next steps of bringing people back to the office? waiting for the the chat to come up but i have a question uh is it is it possible to have a blend of all of them oh and i guess somebody in the chat actually said that a combination of all <laughs> absolutely um i'll get to that in a minute so hold that thought because this again just perfect segues you guys have teed this up to make it super easy to facilitate so thank you for that absolutely it is and I will highlight that in just a moment. Let's see if there's any other thoughts about leadership. And I don't mean that you need to name a leadership style or approach. I'm not gonna assume that everybody has studied leadership, but when you think about the leadership of your organization, what will be most important in your mind bringing people back to work? So in the chat, everyone sort of along those lines of the blend, Diane says it's going to be situational day by day. Um, day by day. <laughs> Shiva says transparency. Um, and one that will possess multiple leadership styles. Uh, Joe says, I believe we need a transformative, transformational leader to start the process. However, however, after X amount of time, I believe a blend of leadership styles will be key. And Diane's is a great point. <laughs> <laughs> you are a very good tracker of the chat. So thank you, Marie. And thanks to everybody. That's wonderful input. Um, and it leads me to my concluding slide. Um, a few thoughts that you have already raised. The style or approach you use in terms of leadership, it might not have a formal name or title. So please don't walk away thinking that you have to be this style of leadership or that. In fact, most people might not even align to your point of this blended leadership approach, might not align with only one type of leadership. Remember, when it comes to leadership, it depends. So it's going to depend on knowing your people and knowing your situation. And there could never be just one approach that works universally every day with every person. Our best bet, as we've talked about, is finding balance. And when we can balance the people and the task aspects of leadership, people plus task, task equals our winning combination. So it's an easy way to sort of remember, regardless of what we label or call it, those of us who study leadership, what we really wanna boil down to is remembering to get the job done, but to do it with humanity. And that is the balance that we're trying to strike. Why? Because again, in my opinion, people come to work to feel valued and to add value. And if we keep that at the forefront of what we're doing in our role as a leader, we can cover a lot of ground. And it'll be challenging ground to cover for some period of time. But hopefully you found that this webinar plants a few seeds, offers a few tips, or different ways to think about leadership where you might want to focus as you see your organization, hopefully, returning soon to some element of work at the office. So with that, I will say thank you.
I do really thank you for joining us. So many of you took time out of your busy days. Yes, I remember it's Wednesday. So your busy Wednesday to join us over lunch for what I hope was a good conversation around returning to work and the type of leadership that can make that happen. We have one last webinar as part of our Stay Connected series, and that's with Adrian Guerrero, who we heard come off mute today. So thank you for that, Adrian. On Friday, two days from now on the 8th, helping us to think about how we might communicate virtually, especially in light of our blind spots. And that's all the more important when we think about emotional intelligence and being sensitive to others. So I hope you'll tune in for that. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them in the chat or you can feel free to come off mute, but I sincerely thank you for your time today and glad that you could be part of this really important conversation that probably needs to continue for a few weeks, if not months to come. So in the chat, there's a unanimous thank you and that this event was fantastic. This was great. Um, it was a great discussion today. This was awesome. <laughs> this was so good. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say a, a big thank you to Leslie for not only this wonderful presentation, but, but for putting this entire series together. So thank you. This has been wonderful for all of us. We've all learned so much and I'm constantly thank you. <laughs> You have been my sidekick and lead facilitator throughout. So thanks back to you, Marie, as well. But as I said, I think way back when in March, we kicked off our first Stay Connected webinar. If we did nothing more than just get together on a webinar, we would have reached our goal because now more than ever, it's really important to come together, find opportunities professionally, but also personally to stay connected. And this has turned into a nice balance of both. So thank you. Thanks to everybody who have been long time webinar um, attendees with us. Don't forget that there is one more on Friday, but I just wanna thank you again for your time and appreciate so much the active contributions from everybody in the chat today. So good luck, please stay healthy and stay well and take care. <laughs>